So here's something new. We've just launched a beautifully designed On Being Discovery Engine. Plug in your favorite conversation or an interview that set your imagination off in new directions, and you'll be offered a constellation of kindred conversations to keep going deeper and farther. When I enter last week's interview with Daniel Kahneman, some of the threads the engine suggests include my earlier conversations with Mazarin Banaji and Ellen Langer. You can also explore hundreds of On Being shows by theme and create a playlist tailored to your curiosities. All of that at discover.onbeing.org. On Being is brought to you by the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Foundation supports academic research and civil dialogue on the deepest, most perplexing questions facing humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? And where are we going? To learn more, please visit templeton.org. The Templeton Foundation. Stay curious. Roshi Joan Halifax has said, I am not a nice Buddhist. I'm much more interested in a kind of plain rice, get down in the street Buddhism. She is a Zen teacher and a medical anthropologist who's been formed by cultures from the Sahara Desert to the hallways of American prisons. She founded the Project on Being with Dying. Now she's taking on the problem of compassion fatigue, though she doesn't like that phrase. Whatever you call it, for all of us overwhelmed by bad news and by the attention we want to pay to suffering in the world, Joan Halifax has wisdom. I think what we're seeing actually is not compassion fatigue, but um, empathic distress, where there's a resonance, and yet we can't do anything about it. When we are more stabilized, then we can face the world with more buoyancy, more capacity to address these very profound social and environmental issues. So that's why I call these things edge states, because they really call us to our edge. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Roshi Joan Halifax lives at the Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which she founded and where she is the abbot. Students from around the world come to Upaya to study the relationship between contemplative practice and social action. A thousand people soaked up Roshi Joan Halifax when I interviewed her in 2012 at the Hall of Philosophy at the Chautauqua Institution. So, Joan, um, I've been reading things you've been writing the last few years since we spoke before, and uh, I loved uh, the title of this essay you wrote called Seeing Inside, Mm. which I'm always looking for fresh language for the important ordinary things we do. And that's really fresh language about spiritual life, contemplation, reflection. And you trace that experience of yours back to a period as a young girl, the the beginnings of that experience, when when a virus took away your eyesight. Mm. Was that for a couple of years? Yeah, I just... uh That blessing that comes from a catastrophe has been a a theme in my life. Um, So um, when I was four, I woke up and um, I couldn't see. And I I have a very distinct physical memory, which is the feeling of my hand against um, the wall of the hallway between my bedroom and my parents' bedroom. And it's just, you know, that sense of... um, uh, the tactile world, uh, suddenly it's about survival. And then I spent two years in this compromised situation, and um, it was a, a period of uh, discovery. Because, you know, when you're four, you don't really know any better. <laughs> it's all about discovery. So all of a sudden, the discovery field shifts from what normal discovery is for a four-year-old to discovering that I had an interior life. (laughs) Four-year-olds should have that chance, but not in that way, if you know what I'm saying. I think it's really... It's it's actually an amazing time of life. Four-year-olds are actually asking all the big questions. And then to have those questions uh, directed not so much toward the outside world, but to realize that I could internally imagine the world because I had been sighted. And that was like, oh, you know, you took your dreams for granted. 
as a child. You took your ability to kind of imagine worlds through listening to your parents tell stories or read stories. But suddenly, another level of your life opens up when you recognize that actually um, you have a life that is act inside. Mm -hmm. So the essay I sent to Chris is one I wrote about two weeks ago. A little book is being produced of my photographs because when I got my vision back, um, my father and mother gave me a Kodak Brownie camera. Anybody <laughs> have a camera like that? Let's say rest in peace Remember Kodak, that? Those, right? <laughs> those little boxes with a little gray sort of button on the side, the thumb button with the ridges. You remember that camera? And I started um, taking photographs. And it, it's been a, a lifelong joy for me. It's not being about being a photographer, but it's, it was about seeing inside. Mm. And then you've described discovering Buddhism and meditation in your 20s as another experience of yeah. learning to see inside then in a different way. You know, uh, Krista, to link it back to this uh, childhood opportunity I was given, um, <laughs> you know, my father was a businessman. My mother was a kind of, she liked to play golf. And my parents hired this amazing Afro-American woman to take care of me. And this woman's mother had been a slave. And um, just tells you how old I am. <laughs> uh, and um, she was free. Her name was Lilla Robinson. She had three daughters. All her daughters ended up being preachers. <laughs> so I was like a daughter, too. She definitely, her value and values and spirit got inside of me. But um, she really infused me, as did my parents, with a, a sense of social justice and of responsibility for this world. It's like Teilhard de Chardin writes about. You know, we... The more aware we become, the more responsible we recognize we are for what is and what will be. And this woman really gave me a big dose of that. Mm -hmm. So um, I went to college at Sophie Newcomb in New Orleans. And suddenly, um, before me was the civil rights movement. And it just, it was like this kind of earthquake, internal earthquake, where I knew that things, that the way that the person who had taken care of me when I was a child was treated, I knew it was, wasn't right exactly. And I knew her circumstances weren't right. But when Dr. King and the whole movement became you know, so present for me, um, I couldn't turn away from it. And from that, of course, uh, then the civil rights movement led to the anti-war movement. And a lot of us got deeply involved in that world, and I was one of those people mm -hmm. among many thousands of others, and was very polarized. Um, you know, I lived in a right and wrong world. And it had actually caused me quite a bit of suffering because um, I was right and they were wrong. And then um, I read D.T. Suzuki, I went to a talk in New York by Alan Watts. Um, I walked in a peace march in 1966 uh, on Fifth Avenue with Thich Nhat Hanh, and I went, you know, I'm one of these. You know, that's so interesting. I mean, I've heard a lot of stories about the 60s and civil rights movement, and, and I've also talked to a lot of Buddhists who discovered Buddhism in the 60s and 70s, and I've never heard the two quite put together in that way, but I mean, Thich Nhat Hanh is somebody who Martin Luther King Jr. Not, uh, proposed for a Nobel Peace Prize. Exactly. There's a sentence you wrote about discovering Buddhism. You, you talked about tasting stillness and knowing that it was medicine. Uh-huh. Explain yeah. that. Of course, I don't remember writing that sentence, but... Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you think it's a good sentence? But actually, I, I think it's... Uh, I could have said that. <laughs> okay. No, it's, um, it is really true. And of course, in Buddhism, um, uh, there are practices which are about actually stopping or cessation, um, about taking a backward step, which is not a very popular concept in our world, um, but also about coming to a place where the heart and mind are genuinely reflective. Mm 
where we're able to perceive reality in an unfiltered way. And you have this beautiful lake uh, just to my right. And I imagine there are times when that lake is absolutely still, Lake Chautauqua is just completely still and reflects everything around it clearly. And there are times when the wind rustles the water and the images in the lake become fractured and you can't see things so clearly. So the practice, in essence, is about creating an internal experience of stillness where you're able to perceive in a very uh, vivid, clear, non-dual way. Something else that you write about, and that I, I this is all about discovery. But you know, your your early your twenties and thirties were really you know incredible times of discovery. I mean, you drove three and a half weeks across the Sahara Desert to be with the Dogon people who you studied. And one of the things you you discovered with them, you started to see, was ritual. Ritual is something that human beings need. Uh, and that was also something that you hadn't learned in this culture, mm. in American culture. Um, would you say something about that? You know, um, I ended up at Columbia University uh, doing this cross-cultural work and then went to Paris and worked in the Musée de l'Homme and then on to Africa and did this... Uh, oh, my poor parents, actually, I feel... <laughs> <laughs> I would hate to have been a parent of someone like me. And so, you know, driving across the Sahara Desert um, uh, into Mali and putting my VW bus on a barge, uh, going down the Niger River, ending up in Mopti, and then driving into Bandiagara, where the Dogon lived. And I, I went there because um, a very renowned anthropologist who was deceased uh, when I got to Paris, Marcel Gouriol, but his student, Germain Dieterlin, had studied the Dogon for many years. And Griol had missed this opportunity, but Dieterlin, his student, had not. And that was to observe a rite of passage that happens once every 53 years. Really? That goes over a seven-year period. And he had collected a huge amount of information about this Krista, um, but had died before he could witness it. But Dieterlin hadn't, and she suggested I go. And so, indeed, I went. And it was, um, again, one of these moments where you wake up to what isn't in your own world. And what I saw was it not just an individual, like a, a, 12, a, a pubescent child, a boy or girl, going through a rite of passage, but what I saw was an entire society, an entire culture, going through a rite of passage where they died and were reborn, on the level of metaphor, but you know, deep physical enactment. And I remember sitting in the Bandiagara Cliffs watching this uh, extraordinary ceremony where the women who had uh, been alive in a previous Siggy, it's called Siggy, um, led the uh, procession, powerful and proud, who were obviously, you know, in their 60s or 70s or 80s. And this is a very tough world. And I just remember them pushing uh, in this red gold sand out in front of the gaggle in, as the ceremony uh, unfolded. And I watched this. Uh, it went on for you know, a long time, and it actually transpires in different villages. It goes over a seven-year period. But um, I watched it, and I had this, you know, it was like another aha. And I realized, as I was sort of sitting there, crouched in this uh, crevice of a cliff, watching this transpire, what in my world, what in my country allows us to mature? And then I reflected and I said, wars do. 
When a baby is born, usually no real rite of passage that sacralizes an individual's life. Mm -hmm. When an individual encounters their puberty where our identity changes in a really extraordinary way, again, there's nothing to mark that change in the lives of most of our young people. Marriage is where we do mark <laughs> change, but it's, it's done often in a way where um, the whole village isn't there in a it's sense. It's still very individualistic, the way we create that ritual. It is. You know, I, I was thinking, in terms of war, I've talked to chaplains working with veterans coming back now, and, and they're actually trying to recover rituals because they say when soldiers came back from war, there used to be rituals of re-entry. Exactly. And, and, you know, we're now learning the effects of dropping people back into a life which is another, a world away from where they've been. But it wasn't just them, it was everybody who participated in that. And, it, you know, it's not just, I think that it's not just returning vets. I mean, if we just segue over into that situation, you know, entire communities, families are deeply affected by the change in those people who return from wars. Mm -hmm. But you know now it's it's very complicated in our world, so I became very interested in the effects of rites of passage on how we actually mature ourselves mm -hmm. and how we integrate into the various life phases or into the transitions through loss, through death, through geographical change, moving from one place to another, and so forth. I mean, here's, here's something else you said about being there um, with the Dogon people. Um, you said, over the days, watching from the shade of sandstone and cliff crevices, I was overwhelmed with the sense of history that was not bound by time. Mm. And, yeah, that's another thing. We experience time as such a bully. And that, I guess, is another thing that rituals do for us. They release us from that trap of a sense of time as small and locked. Well, just imagine um, a ritual process for the whole culture that goes on over seven years. You know, we're such, a, as you said, a time-driven, time-bullied culture. But also what ritual does is it invokes in us a sense of timelessness. It drops us into the past, it brings up the present, also projects into the future, but it is also deeper than chronological time. And that's, you know, the experience, the direct experience I had in um, being with the Dogon, that uh, time disappeared when the sacred was unfolding in that culture. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today at the Chautauqua Institution in New York with Zen Abbott and medical anthropologist Joan Halifax. She was a distinguished visiting scholar at the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress in 2011, and she worked there with scientific research and spiritual teaching on the area of new urgency for her. In simple terms, you might call it the downside of compassion, how we can be defeated by our own impulse to care. the interesting ways that you and others are coming at actually both spirituality and science uh, and technology from a different direction is um, some work you did at the Library of Congress in the recent years, which is really interesting. So I thought even just the title of the uh, kind of the talk you gave uh, about some of that research, um, I want to take this apart and go into this. So Inside compassion, edge states, contemplative interventions, neuroscience. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, so <laughs> let's start with edge states. What are, what are edge states? So edge states are states where the individual's identity is challenged. 
And they would include, for example, things like pathological altruism. Altruism, <laughs> you know, you where that, yeah. um, we harm ourselves physically or mentally when we engage in care of others. Or vital exhaustion. Is that another way to say the stress of caregiving? Well, yes, but, you know, caregiving can be reappraised as a path and as a great opportunity. And in fact, there are some studies that um, show that caregiving can enhance our resilience, not deplete us. And there are other studies that show the opposite. But I think that uh, we are going to have to really reinvent or reappraise the, the path of caregiving. I mean, because also on this subject of dying, I mean, the fact is we also live longer and die more slowly. And, and the other side of that is we create this culture in which many of us will be caregivers, you know, not only perhaps for children, but for parents. And it's true. So and I, yeah. I just had, you know, a little back injury and have been the recipient of care, which I have to say as a caregiver is really a hard thing to do. <laughs> you know, when the tables are turned... Um, it's, it's difficult. You know, another edge state is what is commonly called burnout or vital exhaustion. And it's when, you know, a caregiver or, or someone at a university who's a teacher or, or wherever um, is not able to actually establish correct agreements and boundaries with the institution for whom they're working. And as a result of that, um, become completely depleted. And I don't know anyone like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not common at all. No. And, and another one is uh, secondary trauma or vicarious trauma. And that is, you know, just being exposed to people who are suffering. Say, uh, you know, you're a person who works in the end-of-life care field or you're a person who uh, is a chaplain in the military where you're hearing these terrible stories of of you know, pain and suffering and violence and abuse, and it begins to get you. And so you suffer these effects vicariously that are similar to what people suffer when they come back from the war. And you know, what I was thinking as I was reading this is it, it touches on something, I think that's something that's happening as to, even also to us as citizens in a, in a, to, to a different degree. It's come up here at Chautauqua this week. Um, compassionate people are overwhelmed now with the deluge of terrible news. Yeah. The pictures are too present and too vivid. That you know, the news cycle is too relentless. Um, I see pictures of children in faraway places that wreck me for a day. Yeah. Right. So, um, the question that's out that's in this room and I think is out there in the world and in this country right now is, you know, how do we find the courage and I, I how do we heal enough? How do we be present to that by not and not be overwhelmed by it? Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is one of the reasons why I identified these edge states, because when you realize and and the issue that you were bringing up, for example, about violence toward children, um, whether subtle or direct, and also that we are subjected to these images through our media, uh, bombarded, um, uh, is, I think, a more accurate statement. So we enter into what we would call a state of moral distress and futility. And the moral distress um, is something that where we see that something else needs to happen. Children need to be protected. Uh, we have to stop rape and violence toward women in the Congo. And we feel this profound moral conflict, and yet we can't do anything about it. And we enter into a, a state either of moral outrage, or we start um, into, we go into states of avoidance where, through addictive behaviors, where we just, you know, we just don't want to deal with it. Or we just go into another state of withdrawal, a kind of numbness. Tune out, right. Fr uh, free into freeze. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this world um, that is hooked up uh, in the media right now, uh, that's you know, a good part of the globe, is going numb. 
Um, and I don't really agree, Krista, with the term compassion fatigue. I think what we're seeing actually is not compassion fatigue, but um, empathic distress, where there's a resonance, but we're not able to stabilize ourselves when we're exposed to this kind of suffering. Um, when we are more stabilized, then we can face the world with more buoyancy. We have more resilience. Of, you know, we've got more capacity to actually address these very profound social and environmental issues. Mm -hmm. So that's why I call these things edge states, because they really call us to our edge. And then do you propose antidotes? I mean, is contemplative intervention a way to talk about what we do? Well, I think there are many antidotes, actually. Um, I think a, a setting like this, which is so uh, physically beautiful and psychosocially safe, is important. I think that there are houses of worship in uh, many denominations here, so people can go and touch into the stillness and as well into the inspiration. Um, for me, the path of meditation has been critical because I'm a very passionate person. Mm -hmm. And I have learned to actually um, uh, downregulate and to become, in a way, more sensitive uh, without being hyper aroused, which would cause me to withdraw. And so, working, for example, in my own uh, experience with meditation, of training the mind so that I'm sensitive to a place where I'm at my edge and I can actually withdraw, but not completely, in order to ground myself. Or I can work that edge skillfully. These are pieces of self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. I remember talking once to Ingrid Yort, who's been a student in the Burmese, and a practitioner of the Burmese Buddhist tradition. And she talked about a teacher of hers who'd also been a teacher to Aung San Suu Kyi, who talked about how the great virtues have near enemies. Do you yes. know this teaching? Oh, yeah. And that a near enemy to compassion is sorrow. Yeah. And that's that sorrow. That's, that, that's me getting wrecked by the picture of the child in the newspaper so that I can't actually help them. Exactly. And the near enemies are, are um, uh, very subtle. You... Uh, you their pity, right. their consolation. Well, and sorrow feels like the appropriate reaction. Exactly. But um, compa the reason why I've objected, Krista, to this term compassion fatigue, because compassion um, is not in that uh, context of pity, for example. Um, but compassion can also feel have a taste of sorrow in it, but it has many more features which uh, you're, you're aware of since you read my paper on it. <laughs> you can listen again and share this conversation with Joan Halifax through our website onbeing.org. There you'll also find a link to my 2005 interview with Joan Halifax in a show we called A Midwife to the Dying. Coming up, Joan Halifax on the human opportunities of loss and grief and her counsel if you're just a little bit curious about trying meditation. I'm Krista Tippett. On Being continues in a moment. Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer envisions a world that embraces love as a guiding principle and animating force for our lives, a powerful love that helps us live in sacred relationship with ourselves, others, and the natural world. Learn more by visiting Fetzer.org. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, my live conversation at the Chautauqua Institution in New York with Roshi Joan Halifax. She's a Zen teacher, medical anthropologist, and the embodiment of engaged Buddhism. We've been talking about her complex understanding of compassion in our personal lives and in our engagement with the world, how it can have destructive as well as nourishing effects. And then the other absolutely fascinating thing that comes into the discussion of compassion these days and, and lots of virtues is neuroscience. Right. 
this work of Richard Davidson, who some of you may have heard of. He's at the University of Wisconsin. He started studying the brains of meditating Tibetan Buddhist monks. And they've learned many fascinating things. Um, one of them that has actually infiltrated the rest of neuroscience is the idea of neuroplasticity. I think this is one of the most exciting discoveries of mm-hmm. our time, that our brains change across the lifespan. They don't stop growing when we're 12 or 18 or 25. Um, and they're trainable. Very interesting. So tell me sp- specifically how that, that new research and what's happening in neuroscience has flowed into all these things you've been working on and talking about for decades. Well, you know, I think the theme of compassion has been important in Western culture, and it certainly is important in Eastern culture, but it's a kind of fuzzy word. And um, when Antoine Lutz and Ritchie and others have been, uh, you know, finding out about, you know, certain structures of the brain lighting up, certain areas of the brain lighting up when people are in states of compassion. Also, here's a very interesting one, that these, you know, 10,000 plus hour meditators, um, Tibetan adepts, uh, they feel acutely, uh, more acutely, an experience of another of uh, suffering, but also they let go of it much more quickly. Mm-hmm. It's not like uh, meditators are in this state of kind of numb equanimity. In fact, um, they feel the, the deep press of suffering, but it's a much briefer impact on the neural system than the average individual. And that brief impact means they let go of it much more quickly. And then what they're actively practicing is that those positive uh, compassion and actions. That's right. And then you have a whole range of features related to insight. For example, one of the features that um, the neuroscientists have discovered is an area of the brain that's associated with the capacity to actually distinguish self from other. In other words, if there's such great resonance when you're in the presence of suffering with the other, you go into empathic over-arousal. But when you're able, like if I'm sitting with a prisoner on death row, or I'm sitting with a person suffering from intractable pain, I can feel this resonance. I can sense into um, their suffering but I also have simultaneously this insight, it's that person suffering and this is me. Right. I'm not experiencing it in reality. It's true, but it's not. You know, That's it's one of those things you have to learn as a parent to do, right? To, yeah, well, I don't know, because yeah. I'm not that yeah. kind well, of a parent. Well, but I think, I think that's, I know that's something I've, um, I've been aware of, you know, with a teenage daughter, mm. right? That, uh, that she didn't need me to be right inside it with her. But of course, I couldn't help but care. Yeah. So that's much more in the domain of compassion, that capacity. The worst thing you can imagine is having a child in meltdown and you're melting down with them. Yeah, right. And the worst thing you can imagine is, for example, sitting with a dying person who's going through a tremendously difficult experience and then you start to freak out. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not... That's not where it wants to go. Um, is there a near enemy to grief? Or grief is not a virtue, is it? Well, it can be. I, I wanted to talk to you about grief because that's a little—it's a related um, experience to both compassion and dying. Um, and you talk very much, which I think is a Buddhist approach to this. If you've talked about grief as a burden and a gift. Yes. You know, from my point of view, um, the experience of grief is profoundly humanizing. And that um, we need to uh, create uh, a, a, the conditions where um, we are uh, supported to grieve. And where we're not uh, told, why don't you just get over it? Or it's time. Or such as that, Um, that uh, we, in our lives, experience one loss after another. And it can be loss of a breast, loss of a loved one, a child going into adulthood, which is a way of loss for many parents, 
loss of identity, loss of capacity. Um, my own you know, experience of aging is there are capacities I had 10 years ago I no longer have. And I have to reflect upon those losses. And of course, the loss that all of us will face in, in anticipation of death. And it is something that brings great depth and meaning into our lives and also helps us to um, articulate internally um, our priorities. What is really important for us? So um, for me, as a, a, a human being and not identified as a Buddhist or a woman or a Western person, but as a simple human being, um, I value the experience of grief. I think it is, uh, I think elephants grieve. Right. We know <laughs> they do. I think cetaceans grieve. Yeah. And I think that we need to create, as I said, the conditions where um, the value of grief is acknowledged and supported within our own culture. But, you know, you write about it, um, you say grief, grief can be seen as a natural human process giving rise to one's basic humanity, which you've just, just described, yet it can also be a potential trap, a no exit, a source of chronic suffering. Do we need to be able to hold it properly in order to let it go or to live with it gracefully? Is that what you're saying? You know, again, this is coming back to the value of a contemplative practice within any tradition or non-tradition, is that when you are in a state of deep internal stillness, you see the truth of change, the truth of impermanence that's constantly in flow, moment by moment. And so that becomes a, a kind of insight that liberates you from the futility of the kind of grief that disallows our own humanity to emerge. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, my conversation with Zen teacher and medical anthropologist Joan Halifax at the Chautauqua Institution in New York. The theme of our week was inspiration, action, and commitment. Over a thousand people surrounded us in the open-air Hall of Philosophy, and a few came forward with questions. I was really struck by what you were saying about compassion fatigue. Um, in my younger days, I was uh, a social worker in domestic violence shelters. I did a lot of leftist political work. Um, and at a certain point, realized that I was surrounded by people who were dedicating their life to no, to fighting against something. And my husband and I had decided to get married, and we sat down and said, what's our yes? How are we going to commit to living yes on a daily basis? Because if we stay here and do this, we will spend our whole life just fighting and saying no. And I wonder sometimes if part of what people refer to as compassion fatigue is the unwillingness or perhaps fear of doing the hard daily personal work to pay attention in one's intimate relationships and in one's neighborhood and in one's community, because that's constant. That never ends. But if all you're thinking about is, I need to do something about that thing out there, that thing that I see on that television, the thing that I read in the newspaper, instead of what's happening in this house? What's happening right here? And why don't I start there? And once that sort of intention and mindfulness becomes almost instinctual, then the tendency to sort of fall into that empathic pit where you can't feel like you can't get out in response to what's going on in the world lessens because you're building up a capacity to hold complexity. So that, uh, that, that was a question that had the whole answer in it. <laughs> it well, was she's, wonderful. She's a redhead, you see. Yeah. <laughs> that was beautiful. What's your name? Asha, thank you. We agree. 
Yeah. I mean, there is, you know, first of all, there's the recognition. Then there was the intention, the commitment, and then there was the action. Then you made it real in your everyday life. And that's where the rubber meets the road, exactly, in our everyday lives. So thank you. It seems, at least in the great literature, as we move from the age of romanticism to the age of reason and um, rationality, that the concept of death changed greatly. And I'm wondering how much of that, if you've done any research, there, there really was a concept before, let's say, the 1800s that death did bring a better place to folks and how that changed the way people actually approached life without that fear of death. You know, I think with the secularization of our world um, that uh, the notion of death, for example, in the Eastern world that I've been trained in um, as the greatest opportunity for liberation or in the Christian world as um, the path to go home to heaven, to God, to return, um, which was certainly part of the experience of the woman who took care of me as a child, for example. But with this massive secularization that we're experiencing now and skepticism, um, it has uh, separated us from our own spirituality. And I'm not, you know, I'm not a very sectarian anything, if you know what I'm saying. Okay, I do Buddhist practices and so on and so forth, but I'm not a sectarian Buddhist. And um, what I am, though, is someone who wants to help people see inside. And there are many paths to that. Our churches provide a path. Our synagogues provide a path. Um, our great literature and art provides a path. But mostly, I believe that we've turned our vision uh, to being so uh, superficial and outward. And um, there's, there's a potential for a new kind of enlightenment in our time. And that is, I think, um, a yearning that many of us experience as um, we see the world distancing itself from its own heart. So I don't feel hopeless or futile. I'm very interested. I'm so glad I lived this long <laughs> um, because my superficial uh, study of enlightenment, for example, in the Western world um, leads me to believe that um, we have tremendous potential to realize in, this, in these coming decades. I just don't want to say it's a downhill slope, in other <laughs> words, <laughs> if you know what I mean. No, I just think um, if you look at complex dynamical systems, we're in a fascinating breakdown. And what we know about complex dynamical systems is that living systems, and we're in this robust living system, and we've seen eras. You know, we can look back through history. We're in an era of great breakdown, environmentally and socially and psychologically. And when systems break down, um, the ones who uh, have the resilience to actually repair themselves, they move to a higher order of organization. And I think that this is characterized by something the complexity theorists call robustness. <laughs> that um, we can um, anticipate both a time of great robustness, which we're in, with tremendous potential to wake up and take responsibility. And at the same time, um, there's going, we're in a lot of difficulties. And we need um, resilience to make our way through this change. Okay, this question might ring as a little redundant, speaking of meditation. Um, to many, I feel like it comes to mind a Buddhist meditating under a tree for 30 years or something, and speaking of the neurological benefits that it can have, I was wondering if you can recommend to somebody that's not that religious or spiritual, and it's, I feel like spirituality is something that has to come on your own time, and to maybe just start off to get the benefits of meditation, like, 
does it have to be sitting cross-legged? Does it have to be like, what's the simplest way that you can do it and still get the benefits? Like, can it be 10 minutes? Can it be 15? Does it have to be 20? And I just was <laughs> just, I wanted to just have it broken down as a younger member of this world, I would like to get myself my foot in the door, but I'm not ready for the whole like, <laughs> shebang yet. <laughs> An honest question. So, you know, um, our mutual friend Richie Davidson at the Keck Lab has even developed a, uh, an intervention, an internet intervention on compassion that is teeny weeny, where they've seen effects. <laughs> You know, um, the truth is that, I mean, the word meditation, we, in our training program in the end-of-life care field, we actually don't even use the word meditation because it's so freighted. We call it reflective practices or contemplative interventions or, you know, whatever. So I, I feel that what's happened is it's kind of uh, these practices of mental training have also gotten mixed up in the dark side of religion or the, the more difficult side of religion. But also, these practices have been secularized so that they no longer are hooked into the ethics which gave rise to them. And so what, you know, what I feel is we sort of have to meet somewhere uh, in between. We have to have a view or a strong ethical base at the same time, engage in the techniques that allow us to deepen concentration, to have insight, and to also develop more pro-social capacity. And um, you know, there are many programs out there uh, who, that you know, the whole sort of range of mindfulness-based stress reduction and John Kabat-Zinn's work, the work that uh, Dory Fontaine, who's in our audience here and an old-time Chautauqua um, family member, um, participant, is doing at UVA, the training that we do of clinicians, where hundreds of clinicians, including I think some 40 of Dory's nurses and doctors, have been through our training program, which is completely secular. So what's happening in, you know, in the West is fascinating in terms of these uh, approaches to training the mind being secularized by the same token, so you can have a five-minute intervention and it can really produce a nice effect. But we also know that dose makes a difference. And um, so uh, try the five, then go to 10, and then 20, then you might find an hour, and then you might want to actually sort of take the plunge. In, but also be very mindful of what is appropriate for you. Respect your boundaries. See, be sure you're with a qualified person because I tell you, to stop in this world is to create the conditions where a lot of unusual experiences can rise up. So be very respectful of your situation and proceed with love and with care as well as courage. Joan Halifax is founding abbot of Upaya Zen Center in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and she's the director of the Project on Being with Dying. Her books include Being with Dying, Cultivating Compassion and Fearlessness in the Presence of Death. I asked Joan Halifax to end our conversation at Chautauqua with a guided meditation on encountering grief, grief as something ordinary, part of life and humanity. We've posted the whole 10 minutes of that on our website, onbeing.org. Here's a taste of how it begins. So I would like to invite you to put down whatever might be in your hand and to find a position that's comfortable and also that supports you. And listen to my words, and um, if they are resonant for you, uh, if they are helpful, really let them enter into your experience. And bring your attention to the breath for just a moment. And let the breath sweep your mind. And notice whether it's a deep breath or shallow. <laughs> 
And recall for a, a moment now um, a loss or losses that have really touched you, or the anticipation of loss. And I'll offer some simple phrases. May I be open to the pain of grief. Notice whatever comes up, not rejecting it, not clinging to it. May I find the inner resources to really be present for my sorrow. May I accept my sadness, knowing that I am not my sadness. May I and all beings learn from and transform sorrow. On Being is Trent Gillis, Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Maya Tarrell, Marie Sambalay, Bethany Mann, Selena Carlson, Malka Fenevesi, Aaron Farrell, and Giselle Calderon. Special thanks this week to Maureen Ravenio, Joan Brown Campbell, and the Chautauqua Institution. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. And the last voice you hear singing our final credits in each show is hip-hop artist Lizzo. On Being was created at American Public Media. Our funding partners include the Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, working to create a future where universal spiritual values form the foundation of how we care for our common home. The Henry Luce Foundation, in support of public theology reimagined. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. And the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is a Krista Tippett public production. Ah.